everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Om Gnosis, the Occult South Asia podcast. Today, I have the privilege of being joined by Muhammad Farooq. Muhammad is the Inayat Malik Associate Professor and TAP Center Fellow at the University of Cincinnati and a former visiting scholar at Harvard University. His award-winning book, Sculpting the Self, published by University of Michigan Press in 2021, addresses, quote, what it means to be human, end quote, in a secular post-enlightenment world by exploring notions of selfhood and subjectivity in Islamic and non-Islamic philosophical literatures, including modern philosophy and neuroscience. He's the author of three books and over 50 academic articles, which is a huge amount, uh, which have appeared or are forthcoming in numerous leading peer-reviewed journals and edited volumes. He's also the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the prestigious Templeton Foundation Global Philosophy of Religion Grant and the Title IV Grant from the U.S. Department of Education. So, Mohammed, uh, it was really wonderful to get to meet you over the summer while you were a resident fellow here at the Center for the Study of World Religions and get to learn about your work a little bit. And it's just, it's great to have you on the podcast. Hi, Keith. It's, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And yes, it's, I'm so happy to reconnect. And, and thank you so much for the, doing this really um, interesting interview series. Uh, really excited to be here. Of course. And so what I really want to do is sort of give people a window into the work and research that you've been doing. And so I thought that I would start by just asking, you know, tell me a little bit about your personal background and journey. How did you get interested in Sufism? And I know you had mentioned spending time in Iran as well. And how, how had that influenced your perspective? And just in general, you know, what inspired you to take an academic approach as well to these these topics? Um, Sure. Um, So there were were some interesting events, I must say. But on the whole, I I should say um, there are some people who are always going to be bothered by the so-called big questions of life, like about their identity, about their metaphysical identity, who they are, where they came from, and where they're going, those kind of questions of origin and ultimate destiny. Anyway, those questions are always in the back of my mind. But as things things happen, you know, you you t- think about a more sort of practical, you know, career. You think about a life where you can you can have a job and then maybe those things. Uh, but I was really not like that. I was really trying to answer the question of what is the meaning and purpose of my life. And also, is there any ultimate meaning to human existence? Those questions. But nonetheless, I did have a sort of uh, a definite career plan. Um, so that's the reason after my you know, O-levels and A-levels in the uh, British system, um, I, moved, I went to University of London in, 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 Lo- in Greater London and started studying um, economics with particular focus on financial markets and stock markets. And at some point I realized that even when it comes to something as quantitative uh, as um, economics, as a a science like economics, you cannot really understand, make sense of, or predict human behavior without answering, without having some kind of notion of what constitutes human subjectivity. Mm. Or at a deeper level, um, without having some knowledge of the deep metaphysical questions of what is what is real, for example, what is possible, what is good. We kind of take those notions, you know, we, we think that we already know those answers. We, we have answers to, answers to those questions, or we feel like as if the utilitarian approach, which is very much the kind of um, you know, dominant worldview in economics, that's the kind of only game in town. Um, so I was thinking about those questions, and I realized that I cannot really answer those questions through economics, not just through economics, but also even through um, other dis- scientific disciplines. So that was really, that really pushed me into philosophy, spirituality, mysticism, mystical philosophy. And I became aware of the kind of the, the living uh, tradition of Islamic philosophical and mystical traditions. So after my undergraduate degree, I decided to leave London and I decided to uh, you know, go to Iran and it opened 
up for me, the vast world of Islamic philosophy, Sufism, mystical philosophy of Ibn Arabi, and 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 and, and the, the transcendent philosophy of Mullah Sadra, and you know lots of different schools. So I sp- I ended up spending three years there, studied with some of the most famous philosophers and mis- you know uh, philosophers you know in Iran who are also var- versed in mysticism. Um, and also learn in you know, Arabic and, and Persian so they could read, you know, Ibn Arabi directly or, you know, classical texts directly in Arabic and Persian, not just through their secondary uh, sources. So I actually never thought of coming back to the West very soon. I thought I was going to stay there for a while. But then a friend of mine who is also a very well-known academic now, he okay. really motivated me to take up, a, you know, to apply for the PhD uh, to apply for a PhD at, at, at you know North at US you know various US American universities, and that's how I ended up doing a PhD at UC Berkeley, and also spent my last year at Harvard University, and and so yeah, the linguistic, the academic approach, if you you know to answer your the last part of your question, mm-hmm. I feel is very helpful because it allows you to kind of know the language languages and and be versed in the methods of philology and also philosophy so those trainings are really crucial if we're really trying to make sense of the deepest end of sufism or mysticism in in general because oftentimes people kind of rely on secondary sources or they met various spiritual figures well, I, I'm not discount those approaches. In fact, my approach combined those approaches as well. I travel around the world, all the way from Malaysia and Pakistan and and, and Morocco, and then of course other you know, Turkey and other countries, and met with many spiritual authorities as well, just to get a more anthropo, you know, ethnographic uh, exposure to these things. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would say my approach is not purely academic. At the end of the day, it highly values the academic approach, which is, I think, very important. But at the same time, one has to also know things from a more, uh, how to say, like, you know, like from a presential perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing to read a text. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we'll talk about it more. But it's quite mm-hmm. another when you meet a spiritual person and you get a better perspective about certain things. You know, you, you, you didn't mention Bangladesh or, you know, West Bengal, India yet. And, and I know it's such a vast topic that, you know, we could probably spend five episodes just talking about this single topic. But but I'm curious, um, you know, you mentioned to me when we met that you, you know, have a connection to Bengal by birth, correct, at Bangladesh. And, and so I'm wondering if you could provide some context for how Sufism spread into South Asia. You know, I think a lot of people who are watching this will, will unfortunately sort of just see South Asia as kind of a, a monolithic religious, uh, you know, kind of entity that, you know, it's only Hindus or possibly Hindus and some Christians and, you know, Buddhists and so on. And I think that overlooks, right, the the rich tapestry of, of Sufism in, in South Asia as well. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little a little bit more and, and what unique forms Sufism uh, took in South Asia. Um, sure. So I was actually born in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. So I went, I moved to uh, London after my A levels, uh, so in Bangladesh um, you can still go to an English school to um, so complete all levels and A levels. But I grew up in Bangladesh. I think it was in my late teenage that I mm-hmm. migrated to the UK. Uh, so I have a kind of deep connection um, to the Bangladesh. And my 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 ancestors uh, they come from the Middle East and also they lived in the India for generations. So I personally, um, you know, I, I would say there are deep ties when it comes to my socio, social and cultural identities. Um, you know, India or the idea of Hindustan, the idea of Bharat Barsho, you know, it's, it's deeply connected to my identity. So, but I'm also, a, you know, Bengali or Bangladeshi uh, from today's perspective. Uh, yeah, but what is, you know, the topic of how Sufism spread to India and, and Bangladesh in particular, it's, it's a vast topic. So I can only perhaps provide some notable, <laughs> again, notable outline, not even not be able to cover the outlines. Exactly. So as we know, like um, Islam, um, 
first came to India through Muhammad bin Qasim, who in, in the early 8th century, he conquered the, you know, Sindh, mm. the region of Sindh. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, since then, you know, there were kind of, tra there were kind of contacts between um, and the Arabs and, and traders and possibly Sufi figures and, and people of India. But then some of the major figures of Sufism that we know appear uh, much later, uh, like Datta Ganjbaksh in Al Hujwiri in Lahore, uh, 11th century. He is a famous uh, author of the famous book, Kashful um, Mahjub, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, so and then later on, we know about um, we know about the Delhi Sultanate. Uh, we know the Mughals, um, and yeah. but prior to those, the political context prior to the Mughals, for example, you have the you have the Chistia, you have various Sufi orders, Qadiriya, uh, and and Sohrawardiya, Those orders, uh, you know, from the Central Asian and Middle Eastern lands uh, came to um, India. So there are some of the figures like Mainuddin, you know, Chishti, Chishti. And Nizamuddin, mm -hmm. his disciple Nizamuddin Awliya, and then uh, Amir Khosru. These are, you know, just so popular. Um, they, they are kind of universal figures. Uh, Amir Khosru, especially for his contributions to Kawali. And yeah, and Nizamuddin Awliya in India, everybody goes to uh, Azmir mm -hmm. Sharif. Um, yes. So yeah, this is all kind of like everybody, it's part and parcel of Indian identity, even beyond Muslims um, and, and Sufis. And uh, because a lot of Hindus also go to uh, come to some these, you know, these shrines. When it comes to Bengal, um, so it was again around that time, 13th or 12th, 13th, 14th century, we have, so Bengal is known as the land of uh, 12 Sufi saints, 12 awliyas, okay. you know. Among them, Shah Jalal of Silet is extremely famous, mm -hmm. and then Khan Jahan Ali, uh, and then so many others. But th there are two Shah Jalal. So one of them was Shah Jalal Tabrizi from the region of Tabriz in Iran. Uh, the one in, Shah, in, in Silet is probably uh, from Yemen. A lot of okay. people from Yemen, especially a place called Hadramaut, not, not perhaps this Shah, this Shah Jalal, but many others, came from that region and, and settled in India, Bangladesh, today is Bing, Bangladesh. The collective period of uh, the Bengal Sultanate and Mughal mm. period, that was kind of the kind of golden age of Bengali, Bengal, you know, Bangla, today's Bangladesh from an economic, cultural, um, and, and Sufi perspectives. Because, you know, you, A, you know, a Mughal empire at the time was, if not one of the richest, the richest, uh, if yeah. not the richest, one of the richest empires, and Mughals were highly uh, patronizing Sufism. As you know, Akbar was very much into Sufism, mm -hmm. uh, Emperor Akbar, and they were translating um, Hindu texts, Mahabharata as Razam Nama, and other texts into Persian, and there were intermarriages. And there was a lot of interest about, Sufi about Hinduism, especially about Hindu saints, Mm -hmm. uh, from different Hindu denominations, sects, and uh, yogis especially. Um, so we know of Dara Shiku, for example, and his effort to translate um, um, uh, Upanishads actually into Persian, which he called uh, Sirri Akbar, uh, the greatest secret. So okay. he actually went so far as to claim that Upanishads actually represent the secret teachings of, um, of the Quran. Uh, because in the Quran there is mention of a hidden book, and Upanishad is the Upanishad is the hidden book. And he also translated, you know, things from Vedanta. Majma al Bahrain, for example, is very famous. So this is really, really unique. You know, you don't, you know, in the vast world and vast history of Sufism, all the way from Indonesia to um, to Central Asia to uh, to now in the West, mm -hmm. you don't have that kind of uh, pluralistic attitudes toward other religions. Yes, you can mention even, you know, figures like Rumi, Hafiz, there are always mention of other religions or even sure. Arabic, but not to the point where they're not only translating other spiritual texts, but also commenting in a very favorable light while remaining as Muslims practicing Sharia. So there are a lot of controversies about Darashiko, but, you know, it is not known that he left the Sharia or he, you know, the daily practices of, uh, Islam. He he was he never left those, but he still felt felt like it's possible to be a Sufi, a Muslim, while he's still 
um, while it's still incorporating um, perspectives from other religions, not in terms of practice, but in terms of the metaphysical teachings. This is quite significant because especially if you think about what's going on today, if you exactly. think about the current situation, both in India and Bangladesh, and you know the Hindu-Muslim relationships that everybody is talking about, and the kind of effort to even erase the kind of memories of Muslims and their achievements. I mean, just crazy, so crazy, because you have to then also forsake your, you know, good deal of your, you know, Hindu or so-called Indian achievements um, mm. culturally and spiritually. So to sh- kind of shift gears a little bit, you know, uh, from sort of the history of the spread of the ideas to more what these ideas and practices and, you know, framings of the self really were, you know, which I know you've written quite a bit on. Sufi teachers often talk about this sort of experiential gnosis, right, Uh, as opposed to ordinary knowledge. You know, what is this gnosis? Uh, What does it mean? And, And what's the difference between it and kind of just knowledge in general, if there is one? Yeah, sure. So this is really at the heart of Sufism. Uh, Almost every uh, major Sufi figure talks about and makes a distinction between ordinary knowledge and and ma'rifah or Mm -hmm. real knowledge or uh, cognition, self-cognition. You know, people translate, use different terms. Um, I I would say just knowledge, but or gnosis. um, Mm -hmm. And then I try to explain how that is different from just ordinary knowledge. So, I mean, uh, it's kind of difficult for people, uh, especially in in today's world to understand some of these subtleties because we tend to first of all confuse uh, the words um, information with knowledge to begin with you know because it's supposed to be an information age because of yeah. the internet so you know information is simply data maybe some numbers um, you know uh, you can have data about the let's say the history of the stock market i don't know why that just came to my mind. <laughs> you, know, you have a, you know, a lot of data but in order to have something meaningful you have to kind of come up with a theoretical framework or a methodology. Just kind of telling us some numbers does not mean anything, right? Uh, so that's that's very fairly kind of clear, the distinction between information and knowledge. But when it comes to Sufism, there's a further distinction between just ordinary knowledge. Like we can, if we ask what is the capital of Bangladesh, we can say, you know, Dhaka. Uh, that's a kind of very basic knowledge. Uh, But when Sufis are talking about knowledge, they're talking about a completely different kind of knowledge, something, as you mentioned, experiential. So what is the difference? So imagine, uh, let me give some examples. Hmm. Imagine uh, knowing a person. So what happens when you get to know a person? We know about their uh, physical characteristics, uh, their appearance. We know about their, um, you know, other kind of character traits. We know about uh, a lot of other information about them, right? But that's uh, all of this information can be gleaned thanks to the internet today, even through Facebook or on another internet, uh, whatever social media. Uh, however, when you actually meet the person, the experience of meeting another person, this the factor of being in the presence, just that experience of pre- being in the presence of another person, is definitely different from just collecting, you know, various facts about that person, and then. Think about other examples like um, honey. Mm. So we can, again, talk think about the kind of chemical properties of honey. We can kind of talk about it at length. But then the actual act of eating, you know, drinking honey is very different. The yes, tasting absolutely. honey, sorry. Tasting honey is very different from just knowing its, you know, chemical properties. And Sufis like Ghazali, they even give more, uh, pointed examples like the example of uh, having a physical relationship with you know with your spouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ghazali says that you know it's one thing to kind of hear about this, but it's quite another to kind of have that experience. And he's giving that in, in, in example intentionally because to bring out the kind of um, the subtle difference b- between the experience itself and the kind of just knowing about it through another uh, channel. And they use different terms like though, which literally means taste. It's somewhat like rasa uh, in Indian aesthetic theory. I mean, there, there is a kind of definitely overlap, but not exactly the same. But this idea of tasting things as opposed to just knowing, collecting facts, is at the heart of Sufi 
Sufi epistemology. Why? Because um, Sufis are ultimately about self-realization, self-actualization. Uh, so they would say that we, we all have a given identity, a given cultural identity, a social identity, or even a religious identity. Uh, but that does not tell us who we deeply, who we really are. And mm. who we really are is foundational to also answer who the ultimate reality is. What is the nature of ultimate reality? There's a profound connection. And they often repeat this Arabic phrase, um, Arabic saying attributed to the Prophet, which says, Man arafa nafsahu, faqad arafa rabbahu. Whoever um, knows himself knows his Lord. Um, mm. So knowing at the level of ma'rifa through Sufi practices is very different from just knowing, oh, I'm good, I have this set of skills, I have this kind of, I have this set of characteristics, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, I get angry at this, uh, sometimes I, you know, I know myself um, about this and that. Those are all kind of secondary facts in relation to our kind of true self-knowledge. Um, yeah, so that's how I think I would initially explain Marifa. Yeah, it's a wonderful explanation here, and I'm I'm really happy that you brought up the is the pronunciation dok, dok, dok. Okay, so dok. Yeah, I, I had read that in in your book that you you referred to it as a supra rational mode of cognition, and I'm wondering, is that supra rational in terms of the quality of taste uh, and the quality of experience that it that it gives is sort of beyond what we can conceive of in in our ordinary rational states or you know i was i was hoping that you could talk yeah. a little bit about how this is you know yeah. framed yeah, sure. and perceived yeah yeah so i i just mentioned that phrase uh, whoever knows himself knows his lord and mm -hmm. when it comes to certain uh, other late sufis like shahwaliullah from delhi 18th century, uh, he kind of adds an additional clause to it by saying, whoever knows himself uh, through uh, presence knows his Lord through the same knowledge. Uh, so I'm just translating from Arabic in my mind. So when it comes to, let's say, knowing a country, knowing a culture, knowing a concept, let's say the concept of uh, the internet, uh, Google, um, mm -hmm. the medium that we are using, you know, we, you can give a, a kind of definition of Zen Castro, sorry, whatever it is. Zen, Zen Castro, yes. Zen Castro. Yeah. 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 So we use concepts, representations in our mind, right? To make mm -hmm. sense of the world, to know it. But when it comes to self-knowledge, there's a fundamental difference. It, we, yes, it's true that we can also have a conceptual representational knowledge of ourselves, like because we have thinking ability, we can kind of tell ourselves, uh, I'm a human being, and human being is defined in different ways. One of the definition is called, it, it, one of the definitions says uh, a rational animal. A human being is a rational animal. So you have the concept of rationality, you have the concept of animality, and two different concepts, and that's how you, oh yeah, that's what human is. Obviously, there are many other different definitions, and, and this is a kind of very Aristotelian, and again, <laughs> very limited. But knowing yourself, just through this kind of concept is very different from having a direct awareness of yourself as yourself without any intermediary, even if that intermediary is a concept. So to have a kind of concrete taste of that, you can perhaps, um, you can uh, do this thought, perform this thought experiment. Okay. You can, I, I don't want to do it. Maybe when it's over, you can think about, you know, just closing your eyes and then mm -hmm. breathing deeply and then trying to dispel all your thoughts and stay quiet, silent, even in your mind for at least one or two minutes. And then, you know, you know, let that experience be over and then reflect what was that. Everybody would admit that they had an experience of themselves. Most of the time, thoughts and other Im imaginations can interfere. But if you can have an experience of yourself without any of those, you would know what I'm talking about. Being a self does not need any concept. So Sufis are trying to kind of um, say to the world and say to any seeker that you, in order to really come to see who you truly are or see the nature or even ultimate reality through yourself, you have to get rid of uh, all of this kind of conceptual representational knowledge 
that kind of build up through our education through various environmental environmental factors or genetic factors sometimes you know they're all intertwined um, so self-knowledge is principally without any of these concepts and it comes in degrees so what mm -hmm. i the example that i cited that experience of themselves you know like oneself to oneself or that experience of self to self is available accessible to anybody anybody can do this experiment that i just mentioned I but to really go to the deepest end of the what i call the ego tunnel at the end of which is some kind of light there are kind of self-cultivation practices spiritual exercises that one need to also perform to undo all the misgivings all the kind of ignorant conceptions of oneself i want to tune in to sort of the last thing that you said about was it psychophysical practices and you know some of our listeners are probably more familiar with chakras given their popularization right in yoga but i remember that when we had met and you also mentioned this in your book this this notion of la taif yes and so i'm i'm wondering if you could explain what these are and kind of how they're connected to this notion of of selfhood in general and and also you mentioned in your book the idea of prana but it's in conversation with um noima i believe yes yes uh, this airy mm -hmm. soul or vital breath mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um so this is again a vast topic the idea of the subtle body um so la let's begin with the kind of uh, the the everyday meaning of the word latif so latif mm -hmm. is a plural of latif in arabic uh latif simply means uh, subtle a lot of, uh, you know, in a, it's a plural, but when it, when it is used in a technical sense in Sufi texts, it means uh, different scholars have translated different, you know, the scholars always disagree about these things. So I explain <laughs> why I prefer my own humble uh, translation of subtle centers of consciousness rather than just um, subtle this, subtle that. Anyway, if, you know, lot of are the subtle centers of consciousness within the body. It's like subtle. Also, you can think about them in terms of subtle points of energy. Uh, first of all, within the body, but also macrocosmically in the in the in the in the universe, there are kind of corresponding reference points. So it's it's a fascinating topic in Sufism and also in world spirituality because similar ideas can be found in Kabbalah, in in even in Christian spirituality and also Chinese alchemy and also you know, of course, in various traditions of Indian uh, philosophy and spirituality, all the way from Vedanta to um, or the other modes of Indian philosophy. So uh, in the Indian context, because uh, we also know that there are a lot of interactions between Sufis and yogis, and Sufis also had very positive, mo many, many Sufis, like some of the famous ones, like Abdul Latif Sindhi, mm -hmm. you know, who, who, were, who actually sought out, uh, sought to kind of meet the yogis and 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 he, after meeting with the yogis spending time with them he thought they were one of the muahidun or monotheist he even thought again you can see that pluralistic vision and you can see this in the in the writings of lalon where you have a confluence of hindu spirituality and buddhist you know especially vaishnavism and then and then and tantrism shahaji buddhist tradition and mm -hmm. and sufism um, sure. So just like the chakras with which uh, um, most of us are familiar and the pranas, uh, the lataif are kind of both. So with respect to prana, like life, um, I mean, can be translated different ways, but, you know, pran or prana in Sanskrit, mm -hmm. Bengali, the same word, uh, maybe life energy, something like that. Vital breath. Life, vital breath, breath common, life principle, yeah. mm -hmm. breath principle, um, prince, yeah, something like that. So... So we know prana is not simply just the breath, you know, the chemical composition, nitrogen, oxygen, those things. It's <laughs> much more than that. It's connected to different subtle bodies, right? You know, so shukshma uh, sharira and then karana sharira and then, of course, the gross body. Um, so you have something similar going on. Uh, there are subtle points and Sufis sometimes identify those points, just like the chakras are point, have definite points within the body. Uh, and imagining if there's not just one body, the most the gro gross body, but also kind of other layers of body, chakras would correspond to different points within the body. 
Hmm. Um, but because there's con- points of consciousness rather than something concretely physical, you cannot completely localize them in physical terms. Okay. Uh, just like prana involves nadis, you know, various channels. Uh, so it's a complicated subject. But basically, they play a very important role when it comes to spiritual realization, because they're kind of uh, they're like a you know bridge. They they provide a kind of spiritual roadmap uh, on about our own subjectivity and how our own subjectivity is also um, connected to the universe and the universe itself is a it's kind of manifestation of the divine. So macrocosm, metacosm and microcosm are kind of intertwined. There is a kind of overlapping relations. So um, prana from one point of view, yes, it relates to the individual, but from another point of view, you can also think about it in terms of cosmic breath. You know, so, you know, this is very important. Latoya can be understood both microcosmically, like some different points within the body. I'm not just using Arabic and Persian terms. But sure. imagining, you know, like chakras, there are names, you know, like mm-hmm. ruh, apple. Uh, these terms, like ruh means spirit, apple means in- intelligence. But in as latoyev, they mean something different. Okay. <laughs> so, you Place know, just I don't don't want to, con- you know, get into the complicated, com- you know, complications of these because, yeah, it will take quite a bit of time. Uh, but thankfully, we have some material and my humble articles as well. Uh, but basically, they provide a roadmap about into the realize about when it comes to the realization of the ultimate self, the divine self. And Sufis use that term, like the divine self. Um, and, and so it's a question of gradual progression, question of realizing a specific latoyev, uh, and then ultimately progressing, and finally integrating in you know the world, even God within the self. But this self is no longer the individual self. So things get very dialectical and complicated. Dialectical indeed. Yes, I can see that. And the the I and I versus I, you know, no longer I, as you read about in your book and, and, and so on.